live from the MGM Grand Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's The Q at Splunk.com 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, Splunk. Here are your hosts, Jeff Kelly and Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back. Jeff Frick here. We're at the MGM Grand in beautiful Las Vegas at the Splunk.conf uh, user show. This is the fifth year of the .conf. Over 4,000 people here, Splunkers, uh, customers, partners, executives, all learning the latest and greatest on, uh, about Splunk. This is theCUBE's third year. We're excited to be here. We love this show because we get more customers on this show than I think just about any other show. So practitioners that are actually putting stuff in place, getting business value, and we're not just talking about speeds and feeds. So I'm excited to be joined in this next segment by my co-host. I'm Jeff Kelly from Wikibon, and Jeff, you're right, it is beautiful Las Vegas today. I know it's a little overcast yesterday. That's all right. I'm looking at this big window way. here, nice uh, blue sky, so that's good news. Uh, so we're joined by David Casey. He's the Vice President Security Operations Manager at Flagstar Bank. Uh, your first time on theCUBE, welcome. Thank you. So why don't we start, tell us a little bit about Flagstar Bank. Um, put it in perspective, where are you guys based? How big are you? Sure, um, Flagstar Bank is a Michigan, primarily a Michigan only bank. Mm -hmm. uh, though we're in the top five uh, mortgage industry, top five largest mortgage uh, provider. Um, based out of Michigan, uh, Troy specifically. Um, and we probably have employees, you know, under 10,000 employees. Mm -hmm. So you're overseeing security operations. Now, you know, we see almost every other day there's a new uh, report coming out about a, a, a data breach in, of one kind or another, um, you know, whether it's Target, Home Depot, but certainly financial institutions, banks are a, a probably the most, I would guess, one of the top targets. So you've got a tough job and it's always evolving. Tell us it a little is. bit about uh, kind of the current landscape from a security threat perspective. Right, uh, as many of the banks have, uh, have been seeing, as well as uh, obviously the, the big one recently with J.P. Morgan Chase, um, uh, and, and all of the, the POS uh, exploits that have happened over the last uh, year or so, um, we continue to struggle ourselves, like all the others do, with uh, balancing the amount of resources, as in staff, uh, budgets, uh, to make sure we have the proper amount of technology in place, enough eyes on the screen to, to detect and respond. Uh, so it's, 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 it's an ongoing battle. I think it always will. I actually think it's going to grow. I think as our keynote speaker for security yesterday discu discussed, it is going to get worse. Um, it's unfortunate. Uh, they're motivated. We're motivated to stop them. They're motivated to get in, so uh, they have the advantage. Um, so our focus really is on actionable real-time intelligence to ensure that we have at my analyst's fingertips, uh, using Splunk primarily, uh, all the actionable data that they need to execute find the bad guys, and, and play whack-a-mole. <laughs> so you mentioned, uh, we were talking briefly before we went on the air about your focus, uh, to some extent, on the perimeter security. So right. I'm guessing that means you know, catching, catching the bad guys before they get in. Talk a little bit about that and, and how difficult that must be with, as you, know, you refer to it as whack-a-mole. I mean, you must be, the perimeter must be getting hit constantly. Right, so since we're restricted on staff, uh, like many organizations are, one of the things we're relying on is the technology itself to provide us some degree of uh, automated protection. So for example, we run an intrusion protection prevention system in block mode. So we're actually, I think, one of the few organizations uh, at, at, in the financial side that are actually blocking in real time. So as we see things happening um, and we determine it's a, it's a known threat or risk, we're going to go ahead and block it right then. Obviously, we've got uh, signatures that are, that, are, that are kept up to date, new ones as they come out, such as a recent bash bug issue. Uh, my analysts were able to put a, um, uh, an IDS IPS signature in place within two and a half hours uh, based on some code that they pulled out of uh, some less than friendly sites uh, to quickly kill the traffic before it even got to the infrastructure, giving us the time we needed to patch all the systems that were, that were uh, vulnerable to the bug. Um, that particular technology also has the ability to block entire countries, uh, and that's something we're about to implement ourselves. We know our customer base, we know where they come from, uh, and so we're going to actually be proactive and try to cut down on the noise. The game is the game has always been finding the needle in the haystack, the bad guy hiding. But to do that, when you have a huge amount of noise, which all networks have a huge amount of noise, we need to cut it down as quick as possible. I don't have unlimited staff looking at the screens. I've got to reduce that 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 volume. And so we're going to actually kill off, block uh, entire countries. 
Uh, we've been putting the list together. It's in ranging around 25 to 30 countries we're going to nail. Um, and it's just one step. It's not 100% guaranteed, but it's, it's an effort. And then we can start paying attention to outbound traffic to those same sites that we've, those same countries we've, we've blocked. Then that gives us more insight into potentially compromised systems that we need to look into. So David, we often ask people, you know, is your budget increasing when we get folks on? But you're the first person that we've had here uh, at this show really talking about, you know, you have a limited budget, you have a limited staff, you have limited expertise. At the same time, the threats are getting bigger, they're getting more sophisticated, they're getting more frequent, um, and the ramifications of a breach. Every right. time something happens, right? Congress writes more rules to, to penalize right. even more and more. So talk a bit about, you know, from kind of a management perspective, budgeting uh, people and resources and your fight for budget versus you know, executing with better tools um, in the face of this increasing threat. That's a difficult uh, topic for a lot of organizations, on, and, and we're not, we're not, uh, we're one of those difficult organizations. We have to balance a reasonable amount of investment um, to what our resources can support. Um, we also have to base it on, do we have actual indicators or instances of compromise that, that suggests we may not have the proper tools or we may not have the proper staff. I can, I can say fortunately, knock on wood, um, we have not had an incident that we know of. And so the tools that we've deployed and the effort that the team has, 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 has made to tune them properly and then using Splunk, of course, to bring it all together, as I like to call it when I sold the idea to the, to, to the, to the bank, the one ring to rule them all uh, using Splunk. Uh, we've, we've been able to manage with what we have. Um, it's never enough, it never will be enough. Um, but if we're smart, we pay attention to the technologies, we target the technologies where we're weak, where we know we're weak, um, and we respond as, as fast as possible when we do have a suspected breach. Uh, you know, like the, the concept of the having a hunter looking for those anomalies and drilling into them, we do that as well. Um, bringing all of that together, we've been fortunate and we haven't had to fight uh, the battle yet for, um, for large, more staff. Um, technology has, has been made available to us as we've requested it um, and it's been successful. So I think we're holding steady. Uh, so I don't have plans to fight for more at this time. Um, but, if they, but if the regulators, for example, ask us to do more, uh, if the bank grows to a certain level or, or, or expands to a certain degree that we have a, a larger risk uh, exposure, then we'll then approach uh, and look for more additional staff and the appropriate tools to help us manage that risk. And I imagine too, there's the yin and the yang of better customer service for the people that do need access to the bank via their mobile phones and other applications. Talk Correct. a little bit about your you know, it must be interesting meetings uh, talking about new functionality and kind of expanding really the touch points into your systems versus your uh, primary focus, which is hardening those touch points, even as right. the customer service marketing guys want to throw out more and more things out to the edge. Right, um, one of the things that, it's, it's kind of a, a broad um, topic. Um, one of the things we, we find important is to partner with uh, security firms that specialize, or firms, I should say, that specialize in security. Um, and we've been fortunate with a couple of the firms that we've, we've been using, um, and they help us. They can bring to us ideas that they're seeing in other customers of theirs that we can look at, determine, assess, and, and, if, and if we deem it appropriate and it fills a gap we have, we can, we can uh, request that, get funding for it, and deploy it. Um, there's a lot of toys out there right now. We, we can't do it all. Uh, I, I'd like to do it all, but we can't. Um, so that, that's part of it. Um, We've deployed some of the best technologies on the market that are available to secure the perimeter. Um, and I think we're stable, as I've said, where we're at right now with that technology. We're now shifting, our, once we finish the country block effort um, and we've stabilized that, we intend to shift to um, some other areas that we are weak in, that we believe we're weak in, or that we need to pay additional attention to and there's been some, actually there's some vendors here with some very cool technology uh, that we may be able to leverage to help us look at what's going on at the account level uh, within the infrastructure. So if account is a compromise somewhere, we'll, we can see the activity coming in 
with the perimeter controls, the security systems. Now let's see what's actually happening on the inside when they use those compromised accounts. That's really valuable. Um, so again, there's a couple of vendors here that have some really uh, interesting technology that we're going to be exploring, I think, over the next few months and see if it's something that's right for us. Um, so again, we're growing this, the, the coverage outside, hardened it, now we're looking at hardening the inside. So use our partners to help us do that. Um, and, and kind of related to that, we heard Godfrey Sullivan, Sullivan the CEO of Splunk, talk about yesterday of security being more of, it's an analytics challenge, not a reporting challenge. Kind of the old SIM model was more of a reporting model, uh, where Splunk takes a more analytics approach. I wonder, you, you also talked about being more proactive right. rather than reactive to threats coming in. Um, do you see a future in using analytics, using pattern detection, maybe even machine learning, to identify threats before you've even been able to um, understand the pattern. In other words, you mentioned you know, we know some of the known signatures and we can look for those. What about signatures that you don't know yet that are maybe new? Do you see a future in where things like machine learning analytics could actually do some of that work for you so that you don't necessarily have to know the signature ahead of time? I, I think I just mentioned that from the inside, uh, the technology that we're seeing that's, that's coming out that is anomaly detection. It's looking at more predictive analytics. It's seeing um, where your normal pattern of activity has shifted so that we can actually, and then it'll bubble that to the top so we can then drill into those things. So yes, we're going to be doing that very thing. Um, it does have a plug-in, the technology that I'm that, that I, I really liking, uh, I don't want to name the product, and, um, has a plug-in right into Splunk, so it gives me the ability to see that data in real time right in Splunk. My analysts don't have to go somewhere else and they can respond accordingly, so. So talk a little bit about how your journey with Splunk has evolved over time, because we often hear, you know, it comes in as, or it has in the past at a relatively low level uh, types of applications, but as, as we just heard, you know, that data can be used lots of ways, yes. uh, as well as then bringing in other data sources. And you're now talking about going even to third party uh, application providers to leverage it even further. Talk a little bit about how you guys got started with Splunk and how that has evolved over time and how you uh, see it continuing to evolve. Sure, it was based, I think based in part on my background. I've, I've been fortunate enough to run through a number of uh, SIM bake-offs over the years, deployed a number of SIM technologies over the years, uh, three others as a matter of fact. So I had a, some experience in the, in the space. Um, when I, when I joined Flagstar Bank, uh, one of the first things I was tasked with was um, we, need, we need to understand what's out there, what's in our environment, who's talking, um, asset inventories, et cetera. Get that all centrally located so that we can start action, taking action against uh, malicious activity. And so to do that, but, oh, I'm sorry, and, but to do that we had to also keep in mind the bank has a lot of very unique applications that are not typical traditional off the shelf applications, and so I needed a, a SIM logging anal analytics technology that didn't care about whether it was structured or unstructured data. It didn't care if it was custom data or if it was standard off the shelf type, type logging data. I needed to be able to have a technology that could bring it all, talk to it all. And so Splunk, right off the bat, won, won, won that, that, that contest. So we actually started the implementation with Splunk in February of this year. So we're only nine and a half months into February it. February of this year? This year, so we're only nine and a half months into it. Oh wow, okay. So it's been a, a very fast and furious uh, exercise. Um, I can say that in the last nine and a half months, um, the amount of information we've been able to find and respond to um, was quite shocking to management within the organization. Um, it's interesting that until you open that door, you don't know what's behind it. And we opened thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of doors. And from, from the administrator all the way up to executive management, not realizing what was in the environment. All this stuff that was happening that Splunk allowed us to do. One of the things I'm going to talk about tomorrow morning in my, in my uh, presentation is human, the hum, humans are uh, visual by nature. And since they, since you, if you show them a picture, they can process it far faster than you can give them a piece of paper that has numbers or descriptions. Give them a picture and they can process it. And so one of the things I've been using Splunk for, not just for my analysts, but for executive management, is to build the pictures. There's actionable data behind that. Those pictures are, are real-time actual data. So when you see a spike in a, in a graph, 
you know that there's an issue, potential issue there, the analysts need to dig into. And so that's what, I'm, that's what I've been doing, um, building that visual uh, so that both IT, security, compliance, and executive management can understand what it is we're doing and the value that it's bringing to the organization. So, Jeff's got to fall, but just without giving in away uh, any of your security holes or whatever you found, is there something funny uh, that, that, that's publicly shareable that, that was just a, oh my goodness, you know, we had no idea in this, in this uh, kind of pulling back the covers, if you will. I really can't go into the, the details on it, but we, um, we affectionately refer to it as slash the guitarist. <laughs> we have a particular, Splunk is reflecting a user account called Slash. And it, we've already assessed it's not non-hostile, it's, there's, there's no threat there. Um, and we're continuing to win time permits to track down where Slash the guitarist hangs out at. He's probably in the basement, you know, along with the stapler, but it's, that's the story. It's, 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 been, it's been trailing us since uh, March of this, past, this year. Uh, trying to find slash guitar or something like that. Oh, wow. Well, so it's a great story, and, and you know I think it relates to a theme that we've been hearing over and over again is that once they, for security uh, applications specifically, once customers have brought Splunk in, and they they identify all these things that you, that they didn't even conceive of before right. in terms of threats, and you know they think you know if you ask them ahead of time, no, I think we're pretty we're pretty secure, and then they open up the uh, the covers and they say, oh, oh my, we've got quite quite a few issues here. But it's one thing to identify them, and another thing to be able to actually take action on right. them. Talk a little bit about how you go from, okay, we're using Splunk to identify these things, to how do I actually mobilize my team to take action? How do I prioritize, you know, when you've got limited resources, how we're going to tackle these issues? How do you tie the analytics and visualization to action? Well, I think I, I touched on it briefly with the, the, the effort that we're going through right now with country block lists. Um, we built a series of dashboards uh, that actually display, I won't name the specific countries uh, and make us a further target, but we've basically taken the, the, a set of countries as a, as a test and we have all the inbound activity being detected by our various external systems and we're right, right beside that we've got all outbound activity to that same destination country and we've got several countries listed that way and we've done the same thing with the VPN, the VPN system. We want to see all external countries, non-US countries that are attempting to connect to it. Mm -hmm. um, and then what the analysts can then do is they say, when they see a spike in activity from a particular IP range from a particular country, they can then go into our IPS system and again, the whack-a-mole activity. It's real time, it's, it's, it's monitored 24-7. Uh, 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 analysts can see the activity as it occurs and they can immediately respond to it. Um, and then, as I said, once we implement the full block, uh, uh, effort, then we'll be able to reduce a lot of noise and be able to focus in really on those assets that may have concerns. Um, and so that's the answer to your question. Really. And uh, I'm sure this is difficult to quantify, but have you been able to calculate an ROI that you're getting back from Splunk? I mean, I, I, I'm saying it's probably difficult because you don't necessarily know the damage an attacker could do if, had they gotten in. But is there a way that you can measure that or, or somehow measure the value that you're getting? Let me, let me change your question. Feel free. Um, and this is a, something that the security industry struggles with and it's just my individual perspective. Um, do you have life insurance? I do. Indeed. How much is enough? Is it returning its investment? You're not dead yet. Yeah, not dead yet. <laughs> Hopefully, Hopefully not. Yeah. So <laughs> until, you're, until you're dead, you don't really know. So right. the same thing with security. Security is an investment, it's an insurance policy. And until you're actually compromised or you have validation of what would have been a successful had you not done X, Y, or Z, then you really don't know if you've invested properly. So begs really the question. Know. So you've, you've essentially shown management that they're, they're a little bit on a more dangerous road than maybe they thought and you know, yes. people are, there's rocks in the road and, and people are throwing broken glass on the road. So are they giving you more money for more insurance, I guess, because it's uh, not quite the safe path that they thought before you lifted up the covers, but you got all kinds of metaphors here. They've not said no yet. Okay. <laughs> because we've been able to show the value that we're providing, and we've been able to make the case where a technology will fill a, a security gap, help address a risk. Um, so I've been very blessed in that regard, um, my MIT. So uh, the future is what it is. We'll see what happens. Yeah. 
Well, David, thanks for coming on. Great, great insight. Uh, you've got a, a session coming up later. Quick plug for your session. Tomorrow morning. It? Tomorrow morning. Nine o'clock. So stop by, listen to it. I mean, there's a lot of great lessons in this interview. Really quick implementation time, right? Really quick time to value in this implementation. Yeah. Uh, picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, real-time analytics and real-time updates so you can take action. Uh, great use case, um, really good story. Thanks again for coming on. No problem. Um, David Casey, Flagstar Bank. I'm Jeff Frick, I'm here with Jeff Kelly. We're at day two of our wall-to-wall -wall coverage at Splunk.com at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Uh, we'll be back with our next guest after this short break. Thanks for watching.